Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, looking at ETFs as the future of investing. I'm Jamie Gordon, featured Senior Features Reporter at ETS Dream. Um, and today, joining us to discuss the upcoming developments in the product class, we are very lucky to have uh, James Thomas, Head of UK and Ireland at Rise ETF, Don Correa, Director of Digital Distribution at Wisdom Tree, Karidi Aguirre, UK and Ireland Business Development Head at Invesco, and last but certainly not least, Andy uh, Prosser, Head of Investments at Invest Engine. Thank you all for being here. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we begin. Please do get your questions into our speakers um, as they'll either be asked, answered throughout by the Invest Engine team or I'll be putting them to these speakers throughout the conversation. Um, just from a really high level, just to get things kicked off, we maybe get some views from the speakers um, about the current market backdrop and sort of what's going on at the moment, uh, sort of vis-a-vis -vis interest rates and inflation. Maybe, Corey, we could start with you on that one. Apologies there, I was stuck on mute. But yeah, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, yeah, just very quickly in terms of, I guess, the, the direct backdrop for, for 2023, um, I think most investors will probably want to forget about 2022. Uh, it was obviously a really tough year for, for markets, both on the equities and bond side. Um, and quite a unique year where both asset classes suffered negative performance returns. So 2023 kicked off with a really interesting start. Equity markets were buoyant. Fixed income markets the same, and then February was almost a complete reversal. So it's definitely been a, an exciting first quarter and fast moving first quarter for investors. Um, so very much watching the data, looking at the inflation prints, the reports, and and any guidance from the Fed, uh, from the Bank of England and other central banks around interest rates and the, the direction of interest rates. So we can only imagine the second quarter is going to be quite a busy one and quite an eventful one. But yeah, so far in 2023, it's been it's been definitely fast moving. Great stuff. And James, what's your view on the sort of current volatility? What's uh, what's really been, I guess, dominating your team's attention at the moment? Yeah, th thanks, Jamie. And um, again, thank you um, for letting me join today. The um, I think what's interesting is we've seen a significant regime change in the financial markets. Um, for the last 15 years or so, we've been in a period where inflation is lowering, um, there's low interest rates, there's significant growth. Um, and as such, the companies that have done well for the last 15 years are very different to what we're going to potentially see in the future. We're now on a stage where I don't need to tell everyone on the call, they're fully aware that we've got high inflation, interest rates continue to go up. And I don't think we have um, any signs of that really significantly coming down. And economic growth globally um, is reducing. So those companies that were able to grow over the last 10, 15 years by acquiring a high level of, uh, level of debt so they can employ more employees and spend more on um, R&D. Those aren't necessarily the companies that are going to do as well when interest rates are higher. Um, so what we've seen is those sectors like consumers discretionary and tech that were really popular in the last five years, actually their popularity is dropping in terms of flows we're seeing this year. And we're seeing investors return to some of those older world sectors, the utilities, the industrials, the materials, the infrastructure stocks um, that generally um, are slightly higher quality. So are profitable, have low debt to equity um, and are run in a more sustainable way um, that maybe aren't as sexy as your um, unprofitable tech stocks, um, but actually are far more sustainable in the way they're run. Um, a good example of this is John Deere. So John Deere is a 186 year old company, um, highly profitable, um, low debt to equity, and really well run from a financial sustainability point of, point of view. Um, but the nice thing about John Deere is their transition in their business um, to actually be in slightly more growthy sectors like agricultural science, precision farming, and things like that. So that's a perfect example of the type of stock we've seen investors look to, as opposed to what we saw in the past, which was the less profitable, higher growth stocks that were really capitalizing on the low interest rate environment. So that's what we started to see in flows and in terms of investor interest this year. Great stuff. And sort of amid this uncertainty, maybe a shift away slightly from growth, which has dominated the last 10 years, we're now looking at four decade high inflation, four decade high sort of speed of interest rate hikes. Andy, maybe coming to you, could you give us sort of Invest Engine's view um, on the sort of current backdrop um, and sort of the significance of everything that's going on? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, thanks, Jamie. And thank you to everybody for joining. Uh, the webinar today. Um, I think it's probably worth starting with a quick kind of recap uh, of what's been going on in markets in recent weeks, because uh, it's been a pretty interesting time for investors. Um, 
I'm sure most listeners will be aware there have been some banking troubles uh, in the US, uh, kind of want to av avoid the term crisis because it hasn't been anywhere near as damaging uh, as 2008. Uh, but the upshot uh, really was that Silicon Valley Bank, uh, who are a US regional bank, were bailed out by the Fed. Uh, and that was after depositors quickly started uh, withdrawing their cash um, after they started to worry that the bank's longer term bond holdings had been reduced in value by such a large amount uh, caused by the recent interest rate rises that we've been talking about, uh, that the bank didn't have enough assets to cover all the deposits. And those fears, we saw those fears kind of make their way across the pond to Europe, um, where Credit Suisse's depositors had kind of similar fears um, and started withdrawing their cash uh, at record pace, um, which then forced the Swiss National Bank and UBS to step in uh, and agree that rapid merger that we saw um, between the two banks to ensure depositors were kept safe. Uh, since then, the market seems to, to be pretty sanguine um, on the banking sector. Uh, it seems content that the worst of the problems have been dealt with. Um, the s and is up kind of 1.5% over the last week, and the FTSE, which is obviously more ex heavily exposed to, to the banking sector, uh, is up over 2% um, over the last week. So that's been the kind of first, first thing that we've been kind of keeping an eye on. Second major market event, again, which we've been talking about, is obviously inflation. Uh, we saw in February that inflation in the UK is now around 10.4%. Um, and that does look scary. It's a high number. Um, but it's really being driven by quite unique factors. So at least two thirds of the inflation surge um, is due to the spike in energy and food prices, um, kind of in the wake of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, oil prices, however, are now down about 40% since their peak last year. And natural gas prices are also down over 70% over roughly the same time frame. Uh, and it's the same deal for, for agricultural commodities, you know, your wheat, your corn, um, they all spiked in 2022, and they've also fallen this year. Uh, and that's relevant because inflation is obviously measured on a year on year basis, i.e. we compare today's basket of goods to the prices this time last year. And it can take some time for these, um, for these price falls to filter through into the headline inflation figures. But once these, these base effects, um, as they're called, wash out over the next 12 months, uh, UK inflation is likely to settle more towards its underlying trend rate. So whilst the and the kind of the exact level of inflation uh, isn't certain, the the range estimates for for 2024, late 2023, early 2024 range from around one percent to two and a half percent. So either way, a significant reduction uh, from the double digit inflation figures that we've been seeing over the last few months. And just related to that point, I think um, the next kind of theme to think about uh, as part of the macro environment recently has been the central bank's responses to both the banking troubles and the high inflation figures. So the knock-on effect uh, of the SVB Credit Suisse news was the potential tightening in credit conditions. Uh, in other words, the odds of getting turned down for a loan may have gone up as banks assess the uncertain outlook uh, for their deposits uh, and regulation. Uh, and this was actually acknowledged um, specifically by Fed Chair Jerome Powell uh, in his most recent FOMC meeting, when he noted that such a tightening in financial conditions would actually work in the same direction as a rate tightening, uh, and said that you can kind of think of the, the tighter credit conditions uh, as being the equivalent uh, of one rate hike, perhaps maybe even more. Um, so while the woes in the banking sector may not have been intended, uh, their effect on financial conditions are generally in line with what the central bank has been trying to do for the past year or so in trying to, to bring down inflation. Um, and that made actually the most recent set of, of rate hikes earlier this month particularly interesting. Um, we saw both the Fed and the Bank of England hike rates by 25 basis points. Uh, and that was a strong signal to the market um, that they believed the, the worst of the fallout uh, in the banking sector was contained uh, and that they remained committed to bringing inflation down to target levels. Uh, it also means that future hikes are obviously likely based now not only on inflation, but also on to, to what extent the credit conditions uh, have tightened. Uh, if we look now kind of to the market, um, it's always interesting to see what the market's uh, pricing in these days. Uh, the market is uh, predicting a 50-50 chance uh, of the Fed raising rates by 25 basis points at the next meeting. Uh, that's based on the overnight index swaps uh, with sharp cuts uh, kind of in the following few months. Uh, and it's a similar kind of story in the UK. Uh, the market's predicting a roughly 70% chance of a further 25 basis point rate hike in May. Uh, with rates peaking at around four and a half percent in October, uh, sorry, August, kind of September time, before starting to fall in the final quarter uh, of the year. Um, and just to kind of wrap up on the macro backdrop, um, I just wanted to touch on the the R word, which has been thrown around a lot recently, uh, and that's of course uh, recession. Now, obviously, fears around recessions uh, have been elevated recently. Um, 
but interesting the figures that have been coming out over the last couple of weeks since this kind of tumultuous period that we've been having uh, with the banks uh, it's been surprisingly robust um, credit card data coming out of the us suggests that although the economy does continue to cool and um, which is kind of as expected um, there's very little indication uh, that the recent banking turmoil has had a really material effect on spending um, and there was a report out uh, from bank of america who was saying that total card spending per household um, fell by 0.4 percent year on year uh, in the week ending March the 18th, so a couple of weeks ago. Um, and they said that at the national level, um, consumer spending has not been clearly impacted by regional banking stress. Um, so that's obviously a positive for consumers. Um, and kind of on top of that, um, consumers are also coming from a, a very strong financial uh, position with lots of consumers having excess savings. You know, they accumulated a lot during the pandemic thanks to government support um, and limited spending options. Uh, which is also a great help in uh, supporting consumer spending levels. Um, and the final kind of point that I think um, is positive for the for the economy going forwards is on the job side. You know, unemployment claims still low in the US. Uh, we've got initial claims for unemployment benefits falling to 191,000 um, again during the week ending March 18th, down from 192,000 the week before. Um, and in January, there was that huge non-farm payroll beat. Um, and the US saw the lowest unemployment rate since 1969, uh, 3.4%, I think it was. So it's it's actually a really positive um, macro backdrop at the moment. We, yes, despite the recent kind of banking problems, we're getting a lot of evidence um, coming through that we could see this kind of Goldilocks soft landing scenario where inflation uh, cools to kind of manageable levels without the economy having to sink into recession. And this is mainly thanks to, to the strong financial health of consumers and businesses, which remain strong. Now, having said that, just a final point, um, and then I'll shut up for a bit. Um, it's always worth remembering that long-term investors should be prepared to experience these recessions, these bear markets, um, because they're just part of the deal when you enter the stock market. Market crashes, they're a feature, they're not a bug, as they say. Um, but while markets have had a pretty rough couple of years, um, the long-run uh, outlook for stocks does remain positive. So I think that's where we are now. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Andy, for what I think we can all agree was a very comprehensive overview there. Um, I think, yeah, in terms of credit market conditions, I think that very, inter very interesting perspective and also on consumer spending. Um, of course, if, if consumers have been able to absorb price increases, to some extent, this reads as a positive signal. On the other hand, some might argue, um, what does this mean for inflation? You know, looking at sort of the professional investor community that I speak to quite often, we hear the term sort of policy error bandied around quite often. So I think, you know, as, as you mentioned, um, central bank policy sort of through to the end of the year, there is still some uncertainty there. It'd be interesting to see where that goes. Um, in terms of how ETF issuers are coping with this or addressing this, um, it'd be really good to hear maybe from you, Don, um, about how ETF launches um, are, I guess, responding to the current high interest rate environment or regime and sort of what products or uh, exposures are out there to help investors sort of deal with this uncertainty. Yeah, sure. And I think, uh, hey, everyone, firstly, I think the key word there, Jamie, was was uncertainty, right? And um, I think in what in terms of what ETFs can, can offer to investors in times of uncertainty, something that we like to talk about at Wisdom Tree is, is quality stocks. I think James touched on that with the, with the John Deere example as well. Um, and yes, when we talk about quality stocks, there's not really one clear definition for them, right? Um, but the characteristics of quality stocks are generally things like high profitability, uh, low leverage, dividend growth, uh, all things which you can kind of ascertain from, from publicly available accounting information. And what those characteristics give to quality stocks is the ability to, to weather storms. Um, and in times of uncertainty, in fact, historically, you, you've seen a tailwind for these stocks as, as they're sort of a, a flight to quality. So that's a good defensive aspect uh, for portfolios in times of uncertainty. And also, you know, given the characteristics that I mentioned in good times as well, historically, you've seen quality stocks uh, share in the upside too. So um, really something all weather to think about and potentially, uh, you know, a good fit for the core of an investor's portfolio. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we talk about uncertainty and the, the, you know, classic safe haven investment that people might think about is gold. And in terms of what ETF issuers can do there, you know, people could look at uh, physical gold ETCs or exchange traded commodities to, to get some exposure there as well. Mm, great stuff. 
And uh, James, to you, the same question. You know, what what are asset managers currently offering um, investors uh, to help them sort of cope with current uncertainty? Yeah, so I think in, t- in terms of what managers are offering, I think we're going to see a big change in the landscape as well. I think, um, as I mentioned before, in a low interest rate environment, it was almost like the tide rose and all ETFs rose with it. But now we're starting to realize there's a few holds in the boats of those ETFs. And we, I think we're definitely going to see a number of closures, which I don't think is a bad thing for the retail market, that actually we reduce the amount of ETFs in the market. And what's left is those high quality, I don't mean quality in fact, I mean high quality in terms of how they're run and really give investors um, strong access to a desired area of the market. Um, on a relay Don's point that um, quality is definitely an area where we're seeing a lot of flows, but um, it's important also, depending on your risk appetite, that you also get areas of the, um, of the growth market. And what we are seeing investors move to is the idea of quality growth. So that's maybe a company that is run in a highly, in a well-run way in terms of its profitability, its debt to equity, its leverage, et cetera, but it's looking to drive its business in an area of the market that we're seeing a lot of growth in. So that could be robotics, AI, et cetera. Um, But holistically, I think it's also important to mention that um, you mentioned it yourself, that investing isn't a short-term game. Um, depending on your suitability, depending on your time horizon, it's important sometimes to invest with your stomach, not your heart. Uh, and remember, this is a long-term game. Um, if you have a 10, 20-year time horizon, it's okay to take um, a bit of pain in the short run uh, to focus on your long-term investment horizon. And on the flip side, I'd also say if you have a shorter time horizon, um, maybe you need income from your portfolio, maybe you don't want as much volatility, it's important that you make, make sure that the ETFs you are allocating to match that, um, that, that horizon and that classification that you're looking for. Yeah, great stuff. And you mentioned sort of bringing it back to this conversation of long-term investing, which I think is sort of central, perhaps when we're talking about ETFs um, or index or diversified investments as a whole. Um, obviously, you had a lot of new entrants to the market in 2021, uh, when I say new entrants, I mean new investors who hadn't maybe touched investing before. Um, you know, amid the tide that that rose all boats. You know, may, maybe that's the Fed put. We could maybe put it as that. Um, however, last year in Europe, even uh, you know amid sort of volatility that hadn't been seen for more than a decade. You know, ETFs amassed more than more than seventy billion euros of new money. So investors are clearly sort of paying attention to this long term view. Um, but for our audience today, it might be worth considering what are the main sort of factors to consider when choosing an ETF? You know, what are, whether, we're, whether we're talking about costs or whether we're talking about how they trade, what are some of the main features that, you know, people need to look out for when allocating to ETFs in the long term? Um, Corey, maybe that's one for you. I think we may have you on mute again, Sam. Apologies there. Yeah, sorry. I was just saying in terms of what the other panelists touched on and your question directly, Jamie, I think it's very important for for ETF providers like ourselves to really have the the wide comprehensive toolkit for investors to utilize in different market environments and conditions. And to your point, you know, last year was almost a different regime to to what we're seeing now and and the years before. So really and truly for us as a as a house with with equities, fixed income, etc., within our range, it's very important that we have those different building blocks for, for investors to utilize. And even if we look at, say, the, the, the fixed income side of things at the moment, um, you know, there are broad kind of capability ETFs where you would have exposure to different maturities of, of, of bonds, but then there are also some that are more targeted in terms of maturity buckets. And, and that's an area where we've seen some interest across the ETF industry. So shorter durate, uh, shorter maturity ETFs where the sensitivity sensitivity to interest rates might might differ versus broader maturity ETFs. And I think that's something we're we're starting to see being a bigger theme in in the ETF space. But when it Mm -hmm. comes to to ETF providers and and, and really supporting investors with their their views, I think it's important for for, uh, investors to really understand what they're they're investing in. So the name on the, uh, the ETF might be the same as another ETF, but in, in reality, the exposure that that ETF provides can differ. So one thing that's quite important when considering which invest which uh, ETF to invest in is definitely the, the exposure that that brings. So the benchmark that the ETF chooses to track, 
understanding what kind of comprises of of the, that exposure is really important so there's obviously headline fees as you mentioned there's the replication method in terms of physical or spot based replication but in reality i think the exposure that the etf is really trying to provide is crucial and it can differ between different etfs with with similar names so um, yeah, I'll say that's definitely a key area to consider, just what exposure you're actually getting from the ETF you choose to uh, invest in. And Corey, just, just, just to add to that, I, th I think you touched on a really good point there. Um, and that I believe in kind of the rental analogy. The name of the ETF should be what we as ETF providers given investors access to. Um, and I think, um, as we said in the previous regime, where it was probably a bit easier to launch an ETF and raise assets in, we can all admit it's much harder in this current environment. And what that, what I hope that means is that um, the ETFs that remain and the ETFs that are su successful are the highly quality ones that are giving investors access to what we're actually promising to do. So if, for example, at Rise, we have a cyber security ETF, we really want to make sure that you are getting pure access to the cybersecurity industry, not getting secondary access to a different area of the market that isn't what the name of the ETF is aiming to do. So I think you touched on a really good point there. Great stuff. And yeah, Don, could I maybe sort of uh, address the question to you as well? What are some things that ETF, uh, that ETF investors or prospective ETF investors should consider um, when you know going about choosing their ETFs? Sure, and I think I think um, Corey covered it as well. Is to use, you know, it's the ETF ecosystem is is very transparent. Uh, you can find all the documentation for for ETFs on the ETF issuers' websites, etc. So to use all of those materials to to really get a feel for, like Corey was saying, what is the index doing? How is it how is it rebalancing, etc. So of course, there's all the headline things you mentioned, the fees, etc. But I think it's important to get a feel for those things. And then again, to what James and Corey were saying, not all ETFs are created equal. And, and James gave us a, a cybersecurity example there. I think a good way to think about that as well is there are many ways to answer the question of how do I gain exposure to artificial intelligence? There's going to be different issues which take different approaches there. Um, so again, use all the materials to figure out what approach a particular ETF issuer is taking. You can view the daily holdings. You can see how that interacts with, with the rest of your portfolio, i.e. are there, are there overlaps? Is it additive? Um, so yeah, I, I think for, from my side, I would say use, use all the materials that are out there um, to really investigate because um, it, it's all there for you and, and it, it makes sense in a diversified portfolio to, to look at all of these things. Mm, yeah, great stuff. And if we're looking at again, you've mentioned the term diversified por portfolio, which I think is a bit of a motif in this discussion and something I hear a lot, obviously, talking about ETFs. Um, and we talk about diversification as sort of a core tenet of sensible investing, perhaps. Um, Don, do you think that ETFs or potentially using ETFs could encourage investors uh, to invest more sensibly in general? Yeah, I think if you're if you're comparing and contrasting single stocks, for instance, um, then yes, that'll be a far more concentrated play, right? Uh, whereas ETFs provide all the building blocks to fit together diversified baskets, so much larger groups of stocks, um, and to do that in a way that matches, you know, each investor's unique time horizon, liquidity needs, and and risk. So yeah, in that sense, yes, I think it can help investors to create. Uh, well diversified portfolios for long term investing. Yeah, and again, we've we've talked about the long term. However, there is obviously an quite an important date coming up soon. Um, Andy, maybe this is one for you. Given we are sort of approaching the end of the current tax year, why is it important for investors to consider um, structures such as ETFs in this particular moment? Yeah, so I think the the kind of short answer to that is ISAs. Um, and just as a refresher for anybody in the audience who who isn't aware. Um, each tax year, you get a brand new ISA allowance. Uh, and for this tax year, that allowance is £20,000. Um, the big benefit uh, of an ISA is that any money that you make in your ISA from either the gains uh, in the stock market or from income uh, is totally tax free. Um, one of the kind of important rules uh, to know about ISAs um, is that you can't carry over your ISA allowance. And this is why it's particularly important to think about at the moment. So if you don't use your whole allowance uh, in a tax year, it'll be lost. Uh, the tax year finishes on the 5th of April. So investors have until the 5th, which is about a week's time to ensure that they make the most of this year's allowances. 
Uh, now I mentioned that you have, uh, everybody has a kind of 20,000 pounds annual allowance uh, and you can split that allowance uh, across a few different types of ISAs. Uh, the, main, the main type and the, the type that's probably most relevant to our listeners today uh, is the stocks and shares ISA. Uh, and they allow you to invest your, your cash into stocks and shares as the name suggests, um, and all the, the kind of gains within, those, within the ISA wrapper. Uh, so all the gains from your, your stocks and shares, the income and the capital gains will both be tax-free. So obviously a great way to invest for the long term without paying tax. Um, so I think it's particularly important at the moment for those investors who haven't yet used all of their ISA allowance for the current tax year. Um, and if they're in a position to do so, they should now be kind of considering how best to utilize that remaining uh, allowance. And given the strength uh, of ETFs, not only as core building blocks uh, for portfolios, but also as excellent ways to gain gain exposure to kind of targeted themes, you know, the kind of themes that that are, uh, Don and Corey and James are all exploring in their ETFs. Um, I think investors should have ETFs really high up on their list uh, of investment options, both for the final push of investing in this tax year, but also for constructing their portfolios for the next tax year. And I think while we're on the subject of ISAs, um, I think it would be remiss of me if I didn't make a shameless plug um, for Invest Engine by mentioning that our ISA accounts are totally free. Um, that's both to open an ISA. Uh, and on an ongoing basis. So if you do have any kind of unused allowance or you want to transfer an ISA, um, then you can visit the uh, Invest Engine website uh, to find out the uh, the terms and conditions. First off, you beat me to it slightly there with my mm -hmm. question I was going to ask next. Um, obviously, you've got these these sort of tools, which are ETFs, you've got the vehicles, which is an ISA, and then you've then got these new ways to access um, those solutions. Of course, you mentioned uh, what your team are doing. More broadly, how are robo-advisors um, and AI, AI powered investment platforms sort of, I guess, redefining how investors are accessing these kind of uh, investment solutions. Is that to me? That, that's back to you, Andy. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so robo advisors are really kind of democratizing the world of investing. Um, it's absolutely fascinating to see the growth of the retail environment um, for investing evolve over the last 20 years. You know, the kind of environment 20 years ago was totally different to the way that it was today. Um, investors now have so much information available at their fingertips. Um, it's so easy to log on to the web portal. We have a kind of website that you can access Invest Engine through, or we have an Invest Engine app that you can also access the, the platform through. Um, and really what we've seen over the last kind of 10, 15, 20 years is that investors are not only becoming more aware of the investing landscape, um, they're becoming aware of things, you know, of the power of fees, why it's important to keep costs low. They're important of the benefit. They're aware of the importance of diversification, um, how to construct robust portfolios that you can that you can expect to have market crashes during your investing lifetime and not to panic. All of these kind of investment basics we're seeing um, investors now kind of being becoming more au fait with thanks to the growth of information and the growth of the robo advisors is really kind of exploding off the back of that. Because portfolios and, and uh, robo advisors such as Invest Engine um, are built on the premise that low costs are good and more information is good. And we're on the investor side in trying to create a platform that is beneficial to investors. So, a good example of that is we don't have any kind of flashing lights going on on the Invest Engine platform. There's no kind of inducements to trade uh, or to buy and sell uh, on a sort of high frequency basis. Um, so, really, what we're trying to do is to piggyback off the growth of the accessibility of information surrounding the investments world uh, and create a platform and an environment that's conducive to maximizing investors' long-term returns, whether that be on the DIY side of things or on the, the managed portfolio discretionary side of things. Yeah, great stuff. And um, one of our audience members was actually just asking about, touching on what you said, um, Andy, about themes. You mentioned thematic investing uh, a moment ago. They're asking about sort of how ETFs are providing access to specialized themes and sort of the long-term potential these might may or may not have. Um, James, I think it'd only be fair for me to come to you with this one first and foremost. Uh, what's your view on that? Yeah, um, thanks, Jamie. Um, taking a slight history lesson, I guess, in uh, ETFs. So ETFs have actually only been around for 30 years. So um, they first launched in 1993 with an S&P 500 ETF, which is as vanilla as you can get. Uh, since then, there has been thousands and thousands of ETF launches, carving up different areas of the investment um, market to really give investors access to um, a specific area. What we've really seen in the last 10 years is a significant growth in thematic investing. 
Now, the point of thematically investing is to give investors access to a secular mega trend within society. So really think of that as an area of society where we're seeing significant growth and significant change. And the point of thematic managers, and I work for Rise ETF and we're a specialist thematic manager, is to really try and give investors pure access to that theme so they can benefit from the future growth. I guess just to touch on why you should look at thematic investing, some of the benefits, I guess I touched on the first point is the growth opportunity. You think about AI, cybersecurity, um, clean energy. These are areas that are attributing a tremendous amount of investment. Um, some of it through the negative side of things, that the amount of cyber attacks we're seeing and the developments there. Some through the positive we've seen with ChatGPT and the growth of AI. And some through the really positive, which is the amount of spending and legislation we're seeing supporting um, the green transition and therefore stocks in the clean energy space. I guess the next point on why thematic investing is diversification. Um, a point that actually uh, Don touched on well is around crossover. So quite often when you're buying broad, um, large cap indices, you'll find you tend to have quite a lot of crossover between stocks. So if you own an MSCI World ETF and an S&P 500 ETF, it's likely that you're going to be holding the likes of Apple, Cisco, Amazon, these stocks quite a few times over. So the benefit of thematic ETFs is they give you diversification to stocks that don't tend to be the big large cap stocks or we'll call them mega cap stocks because there are still a large cap allocation within the major indices. And I think the third point, and I think this relates a lot to the people on this call, um, is more a qualitative one, is it's a really nice way to connect yourself to your portfolio. Um, when I hear the S&P 500, there isn't any emotional attachment I have to stocks within that index. Um, but I personally, um, I'm vegan, so um, I don't eat meat. Um, we have a fund that rise for the sustainable future of food, which invests in the transition of our food system. So within that includes plant-based foods, companies like Beyond Meat, Oatly. Um, and really, I feel connected to that fund. And the nice thing about that thematic ETF, it's an ability to give me access to stocks that I may not be able to get such a large allocation to via broad indices. The fourth point, and this is more of a technical point, is um, around why to use it in an ETF format and why not to just buy the stocks. Now, we mentioned um, cybersecurity. The thing we see with cybersecurity is more than often than not, the best performing stocks one year aren't always the best performing stocks the next year. Um, the nature of a growth um, industry is that there's lots of winners and losers. There's continuous development within the theme. There's R&D spend and companies are continually competing with each other and beating each other in different years. So even though I work in thematic investing, I write a lot of research about cybersecurity. There is no way I'd be able to choose the winners within the um, industry this year. And nine times out of 10, I'd get it wrong. But the benefit of buying a thematic ETF is if we're doing our job properly, we're giving you um, pure access across the industry to, the, to all the stocks within, for example, cybersecurity or AI or clean energy, et cetera. Um, so hopefully that gives a bit of a feel of um, thematic investing, um, some of the reasons why you might um, allocate to themes and the benefit, and why we're seeing the tremendous growth at the moment. Great stuff. And Don, uh, maybe one for you. Obviously, you can touch on themes, but I, I'd love to hear from you a little bit about factor ETFs. Obviously, it's slightly different in the sense that with themes, you know, you're talking about uh, long term structural mega trends, maybe ones that you have an interest in personally. Whereas with factors, you're talking sort of about quant trends, you know, things which have tended to generate alpha over time or outperformance. Maybe you could give um, our listeners just a little overview of factor investing and how ETFs are offering some access to this. Yeah, sure, sure, Jamie. So yeah, you you spoke about um, all, all the different trends, all the different factors, and um, so factors maybe things like quality, which is what I spoke about earlier, and then small cap, large cap, etc. And different factors may work for for different time periods. That that's something that uh, investors can can try and utilize the the sort of different regimes where different factors work. Um, I, I think what I was saying about quality is that it's something that we see to be quite a consistent factor historically. So um, that, that's interesting from a factor perspective. Um, but also generally when ETF providers approach a factor, there are different ways of approaching that, that factor too. So I know we keep banging on about this, but 
it's also important for people to kind of look at how how that factor is approached. If it is something like quality, how what is that issuer's view on how to access that quality? What uh, how are they selecting the stocks for the basket? So I think that would be something uh, interesting for investors to 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 look into as well when they think about factor investing. Mm, yeah, great stuff. And Corey, uh, I think it'd be remiss if we're talking about new areas of access or I guess tilts on broad market exposures not to mention uh, one of the sort of the biggest themes of recent years, which has been ESG. Um, maybe you could talk us or walk us through a little bit um, about what ESG is and also how it's sort of being addressed within ETFs. Yeah, sure, Jamie. So first and foremost, without the acronym, environmental, social and governance factors and considerations to, to embed into the portfolio is what we're really talking about here. And um, you know, ESG really has taken off in terms of the interest from investors over the last few years with, to James's point earlier, investors now being able to express their views and sustainability considerations in their investment portfolio. So it's fantastic. And it's definitely an area where there's a plethora of choice um, amongst providers. So different providers providing different ways to access or explore ESG. Um, so for us, you know, we really look at the ESG landscape. You can have the real broad integration type ESG strategies, which, which can help investors really replace some of their core holdings um, and utilize ESG ETFs in that way, all the way right down to the other side of the spectrum where, where investors can really target particular parts of that E, S or G pillar and, and really look to, to really engage with particular areas on, on, on the subject. Um, I think a key area of interest and things to flag when it comes to ESG and even thematics actually generally is the fact that ETF providers have the benefit of being able to partner with specialists that have the deep research capabilities, that have the deep understanding of those factors and multiple sub factors which fall within the E, S or G and really leverage their understanding of how companies are run in order to score and critique companies and, and build a portfolio which suits uh, investor needs and really does form some form of improvement um, of the kind of non-ESG uh, or standard index versus mm -hmm. uh, the ESG index. So that's one thing to highlight and also to highlight that it's great as well that I'm seeing more and more myself um, providers being able to report on the ESG uh, ETFs that they have. So that's another great thing we're starting to see. So investors are able to really understand what's the benefit, what's the real impact of their ESG investments and, and the companies that form part of the portfolio. Uh, from our perspective at Invesco, ESG is something that follows through right across from equities to, to fixed income. And um, really and truly, we're starting to see more providers actually launch fixed income ESG to ETFs as well, which is fantastic and, and long overdue overdue um for example you know investment grade or higher quality corporate bonds have always been an area of interest and, and we've seen some esg ets being launched in that space um now there's even high yield uh, esg etfs as well out there so i think that's it's an area where we're going to continue to see more and more more ETFs being launched and being made available for investors. Um, more reporting will follow as well. Um, and as I said as well, I think it's a great area where ETF providers really get to leverage the, the deep capabilities and understanding of, of experts who, who can really critique and, and score those companies in order to form optimal ESG uh, ETFs and exposures. Great stuff. And uh, Corey, if I could come back to you again, we've talked about all these, um, all these quite significant sort of areas of product development, whether that be factors, thematics, ESG. But obviously one trend that we at ETF Stream love watching is the growth of ETFs um, as, as a theme in and of itself. Could you maybe talk to us a little bit about why ETFs or uh, ETF assets um, have risen so much in recent years um, versus other structures and sort of maybe a, a couple of reasons about why that has happened? Yeah, sure, sure. So obviously the kind of key differences between an ETF and, and similar um, wrappers or fund wrappers like an, an index fund, which often provides you with, you know, with passive exposure on both fronts. I think the fact that ETFs have that extra layer of, of, of control or flexibility with them in terms of how you can access them and trade them is obviously a key benefit and one of the big reasons as to why we've seen that real growth in, in ETFs over time. Um, so the exchange traded uh, element there really being that you can trade ETFs obviously throughout market hours as long as the uh, the exchanges are open ETFs can be traded versus an index fund where where you know you're you're, you're trading at one time uh, at a day 
Um, so that control and flexibility is key. Um, I think ETS have also increase the transparency investors get when it comes to knowing what they hold. And we've, we've mentioned this point earlier uh, on the panel today in terms of just that transparency and knowing the exposure you're, you're, you're invested in, knowing which names form part of the index, et cetera. So ETFs obviously have the requirement on the passive side to, to produce daily holdings, which, which will be on, on most provider public websites, et cetera. Um, but for me, I think the, the key reason as to why ETFs have really seen the growth that they have is really down to the choice. So we've touched already on formatics, we've touched on ESG, um, and we've even touched on kind of non-standard benchmarks that can even be market cap weighted. In all of those areas, we've really seen a takeoff on, on ETF launches. There are, there's there's loads of, loads of choice. And personally as well, there, there is fantastic choice for me as well. So it's great to know that with ETFs, there, there are options for investors. And I think that's probably been the key reason as to why there's been such growth in the ETF space. Uh, alongside with platforms like like Invest Engine and others, which are democratizing access to these ETFs and the many ETFs that are out there. So for me, it's really down to the, the choice that really falls uh, and forms part of the, the ETF space. Great stuff. Yeah, sorry, uh, can I just add to that? Um, cool. I was reading, I saw a stat the other day that there was there are now around 9,000 ETFs in existence, which was pretty mind boggling. Um, and so there really is, there's an ETF to suit everybody. Um, if you want a global equity index tracker, Obviously, there's an ETF for that. If you want a US inflation-linked bond fund, there's an ETF for that. If you want to buy a uranium ETF, there's an ETF for that. Um, in the US, there's even an ETF that's recently been launched that tracks the stock picks of CNBC investment personality Jim Cramer and goes short every time he goes long. Uh, and I'm not saying any of these are good investments. I'm just saying there's a huge range out there. Um, and it's really a beneficial trend for investors because what all that diversity means is that not only can investors kind of construct the core of their portfolio extremely quickly, easily and cheaply, but they can also, if they want to tailor their portfolio to suit their own views and values by embracing all the themes that we've been talking about today. And this is something, again, that we've been seeing at Invest Engine. Many portfolios have a managed portfolio as their kind of core building block of their portfolio where they invest um, a larger portion of their money, but then also have a DIY account uh, and manage a smaller portion of their portfolio uh, and invest that into whichever ETF they like the look of um, from the range that we have on there. Um, so absolutely right. Yeah, I think choices are, are really um, a really big benefit of the ETF and a big um, catalyst for its growth, along with the more obvious benefits of, of low fees and, and ready-made diversification. Great stuff. Um, Don, if I could come to you, um, obviously we've sort of documented a little bit there about why ETFs have grown. In your view, what are some of the kind of most exciting trends on the horizon for ETFs sort of coming up? Uh, I think in, in relation to the UK market, um, what's really exciting is that we're seeing a real explosion since the pandemic of investors discovering the ETF wrapper. Um, so if you look at the, the US, I think the, the retail market has been involved in ETFs there for, for a much longer time. Um, but we're at the start of that journey here in the UK, which I think is, is super exciting. I think it's going to be a long journey as well. Um, so I think that's great to see. Great stuff. And same sort of question to you, James. Um, what are the sort of trends that you think investors should be watching out for in ETFs coming up? Yeah, I think um, I just see ETFs becoming far more sophisticated. And um, traditionally, e ETFs were very much in like the passive space. I almost think the word passive is going to kind of be made redundant. It's indexing, right? It's different strategies, different tilts, as Corey mentioned, different ways to weight the stocks within your index to really make sure. And this is the point I keep coming back to that we as providers are giving the investor exposure to what the ETF is called. Um, and I think we're going to see that develop through time. I think one of the trends, um, which I think we're going to see a lot of product development in, which I think is brilliant, is sustainability and impact. Um, so Corey mentioned in the question before around ESG. ESG is obviously a risk tool to assess the E, S and G of the stock, whereas impact investing is different in that this is where the ETF has sustainable objectives at the, at the core of its offering. Um, so at RISE, for example, we have an environmental impact ETF that's looking to give you high conviction access to stocks across clean energy like hydrogen, wind and solar, circular economy, etc. And I think these kind of ETFs are going to be the ones that are going to be launching more and more. We now have individual um, EU taxonomy subsector ETFs like uh, circular economy, uh, clean energy, hydrogen, wind, solar. And not only are these great for investors because they're given more options, 
but then moving investments into stocks that are really trying to look to have a positive impact on the environment. And I don't need to tell everyone on the, on the call about the issues in terms of climate change um, and rising temperatures, but these ETFs are not only great in helping you get potential growth, but they're actually great in putting money into companies that are trying to save our planet. So um, I think that's a space where we're going to see a tremendous amount of growth. And I think it's one of the most positive things to come out of um, the ETF industry for me. Great stuff. Um, well, I think most people have heard enough of the sound of my voice, but I think we should hand the mic to the sort of audience and hear what they have to think, uh, or at least answer a few of their questions. So I might address a few uh, sort of open mic to the panel. One of them being, how, what are the things to watch out for um, when selecting a bond or fixed income ETF? Uh, what is, you know, how does, what makes a good fixed income ETF? I'm going to sort of open panel that one to whoever wants to take it. Yeah, I can I can start the ball rolling on that one. Um, so obviously, I need to be careful not to kind of provide any advice here. And um, so maybe I can talk a bit about what the kind of things that we look for when we're constructing our own um, invest engine managed portfolios. Um, so I think the kind of unique features um, that we'll be looking at when we assess fixed income ETFs, it's things like, for example, credit quality. Um, so, you know, we have a, a house view at the moment where we have a preference for the kind of high quality government bond funds over corporate bond funds um, for several reasons. Um, so just to kind of backtrack a little bit, um, government bonds are the kind of high quality bonds issued by governments tend to be high, high credit ratings, um, as opposed to corporate bonds, um, which tend to have slightly lower credit ratings, but will offer, um, in some instances, not always, um, higher yields than government bond funds. Um, so really you want to make a distinction. Your kind of first choice to make is whether you want to go on the high credit quality end of the spectrum to the kind of safer end of the government bond, um, investment options, or you want to go down. Um, and try and benefit from high yield from lower quality bonds. You have also have that kind of uh, distinction between inflation linked bonds versus nominal bonds. Um, so an inflation linked bond kind of differs from a regular bond, i.e. a nominal bond, um, in the return of an inflation linked bond is kind of, as the name suggests, dependent on the level of inflation. And this has obviously been a really big theme, um, both in the UK and the US over the last year or so. Um, so that's a kind of another another factor to think about um, duration. Obviously, that's a that's a big that's kind of a technically a kind of technical kind of jargony word there, um, but it really just means um, a measure. It's really a measure of how sensitive the bond or the bond fund uh, in this instance is to interest rate changes. Um, so the higher the number is, um, the more the bond or the bond fund will fall when interest rates rise. Interest rates rise. Um, so as a kind of example. Let's say if rates rise 1%, a bond with a five-year average duration would lose approximately 5% of its value. That's roughly how the kind of rule of thumb tends to work with duration. Um, so there's a kind of choice around whether you want to stay on the short end of the yield curve, i.e. buy bonds that have a, a low time to maturity um, yeah, because they're likely safer than the bonds that are on the other end of the yield curve, either longer end, the kind of 10-year plus end of the yield curve, where they're more sensitive to the smaller changes in interest rates. Um, so you've got credit quality, um, you've got inflation linked versus nominals, you've got duration, and these are kind of in addition to the, the kind of core factors that you're going to have to think about when you're selecting ETS, like we've talked about, you know, like diversification and cost and the index that you're tracking uh, and all these sorts of things. Hedging, I haven't even mentioned hedging. You've got to think about whether you're, the bonds in the ETF are hedged or not. The kind of default assumption for most investors, and I don't think this is too controversial, is that hedged share classes for fixed income, especially your high quality fixed income, um, is preferable um, as bonds are kind of designed to be the safer element of your of your portfolio um, and investors tend to not uh, want the kind of unpredictable FX returns to overwhelm overwhelm the uh, the returns from bonds. So those are just a few things to, to think about. Good stuff. And maybe one more for you just what, uh, just off the back of that, um, an audience member's asked about the role of model portfolios potentially using ETFs. Could you speak a little bit about I guess, the sort of role that model portfolios fulfill and yeah, sort of what's on offer at the moment. Yeah, so it really depends what the investor is looking for. If they are a sophisticated, confident investor and they know what they're doing with investments, then there's absolutely no reason why they can't um, use the DIY um, kind of functionality of Invest Engine as well as other platforms um, to construct their own portfolio. Um, what I think people tend to like about the model portfolio approach is that it's all done for them. There is no need to worry about any administration um, and you have the kind of trust and ability to tap into the collective kind of combined investment knowledge of 
your investment team, whichever investment team you choose to use. Um, and I think the ability of clients to allocate to that sort of strategy so easily and accessibly um, is a really attractive feature. So again, what we see is a lot of people have both a DIY portfolio and a managed portfolio on the platform. Um, so people will be taking advantage of the kind of more structured core model portfolios um, and while also having a kind of bit of a DIY portfolio on the side. Uh, I think one of the major advantages of model portfolios versus versus DIY is that if you choose a model portfolio, you can you can be a lot more confident that the portfolio is suitable for you. So for example, when you sign up for a model portfolio, you will have some sort of risk tolerance questionnaire to fill in. And that'll take you through question by question. And it'll ask you things about your attitude to risk and how you respond when markets fall. And based on the responses to those answers, you will be presented um, with a portfolio that you can choose to invest in. And that won't always be 100% equities. I think there's a lot of um, investors, especially younger investors these days, that just think that 100% equities is the only way to go, um, regardless of their own attitude to risk or risk tolerance. Um, but actually, that's not always the case. Some investors, even if they're younger investors, don't always deal well um, with losses. So I think an advantage of a managed portfolio is that it really tries to get underneath the skin of the, the person who is considering investing and will um, allocate a, a much more suitable portfolio than they might construct themselves if they were if they were adopting a, a DIY approach. Yeah, great stuff. Um, another question sort of relating to the sort of advantages of ETFs, um, the audience member asks, so going back to what Corey said about the sort of tradability of um, ETFs, how they can be traded uh, through the day, what other advantages do ETFs have versus what well, they've termed traditional fund structures? Um, any of the issues perhaps want to take that one? Yeah, I, I guess I can take that. And this this kind of stays close to the, the liquidity side of things. But if you take, for instance, a, a traditional fund structure, like a mutual fund, for, for example, the net buys and sells at the end of the day will need to translate into trading of the underlying basket. Uh, and that's going to generate transaction costs. Whereas with, with ETFs, because they're traded on exchange, uh, you have this secondary layer of liquidity in the actual ETF shares. Um, and so there could be existing inventory on, on the market between market participants where you can match off those buys and sells. And so it doesn't necessarily always mean in a, in a, in a, well, in a very liquid ETF that you, it would ever translate to trades of the underlying basket, which generate transaction costs. So I think that's an important uh, sort of advantage that the ETF ecosystem brings in terms of efficiency. Yeah, great stuff. And um, maybe James, um, anything to add to that in terms of the edge ETFs offer? Uh, I, th I think, to be honest, um, the guys touched on the points, but it is a bit of a chicken and egg situation in that um, because, and as ETF pro provides, we believe that this, because ETF wrappers, in our opinion, are the most advanced way to build um, a strategy. We've seen a tremendous amount of product development in that space relative to maybe the traditional index funds or um, daily traded funds that we've seen in the past. Um, so as Corey mentioned, there is such a plethora of options for investors to use, um, and they're so accessible um, because of the likes of Invest Engine giving retail clients access to these funds. Not only do you have a huge amount of funds on the market, but you have a really easy way to access those um, throughout the day. Um, so I think because the wrapper um, is so good, it's, we've, it's the reason why we've seen so much development in this space. Yeah, great stuff. Um, perhaps a bit of a regulatory sort of question here from an audience member. They're asking, what is the possibility of seeing US listed or I guess 40 Act ETFs listed on UK platforms? Um, who would like to field that one? I, I, I can give that a shot. I think Andy, if you, if you want to jump in, go ahead as well. But um, for under under regulation here, uh, investors have to have access to a key information document um, for ETFs, and that's not something that's available from for US ETFs often. So, I think there are there are challenges there um, with those being available to retail in, in the UK. Yeah, great stuff. Um, Andy, anything to add or? No, yeah. The reason that they're not available on the Invest Engine platform, exactly as Don said, is regulatory reasons. Great stuff. And another sort of regulatory question on the back of that one is they've say an audience member was asking because of the tradability of ETFs, what is the possibility or scope for there to be short uh, ETFs or ETFs that go short on certain indices or sectors um, here in Europe? 
Yeah, I think, to, to be honest, Jamie, um, you are seeing those in the US. And I do think the US, I wouldn't say in sustainability, but in the number of ETFs there are, they kind of pave the way for the um, ETF development in Europe. Um, the one thing I would say, and this isn't just to retail investors, it's also to professional investors, it's important to be um, very prudent in what you're allocating to and making sure that the structure is um, correct for you. Now, when you get into the space of short and ETFs, or if you get into the space of ETFs that have shorts built into it, it's really important that you make sure the manager doing it um, has the credentials and is doing it in the right way. Um, so I think it's very likely we're going to start seeing ETFs in this space in the European market and in the UK. But as a retail investor, I'd just be very prudent in making sure that that's suitable for yourself. Um, and the ETF is really looking to give you the desired outcome that you're looking for as well. Great stuff. And uh, Andy, I think one for you here. How are developments in AI and robotics um, impacting how we trade ETFs? Um, they're asking... Do you think it, it'll be possible to set rules on platforms to trade automatically based on price? Yeah, I think that's definitely something that'll be um, coming out a lot more in the future. I know it's a big trend in the US, um, automated buying and selling based on sort of price targets. But I think for people looking for that sort of functionality, it's important to zoom out a little bit and to understand that investing is a kind of long term game. This isn't something that will be. Um, you're not supposed to be buying and selling um, intraday, you know, unless you're a, a high frequency trader based out of the US. But for most of the retail investors, um, and I think the majority of people on this webinar, um, it's really important to remember um, that investing is a long term game and the intradaily prices and the price movements day to day, week to week, month to month um, are going to have very little impact on the final portfolio return that you have after 20, 30, 40 years of investing. Um, and actually, the more you do try and trade, the more you try and time the market, the more you try and predict when the market's going to fall and find an attractive entry point. What happens 99 times out of 100 is that you end up shooting yourself in the foot and doing serious damage to your own portfolio. Um, so I think that, yes, these sorts of functionalities um, will um, proliferate more um, across Europe uh, and the UK. Um, but I would just make sure, um, as to, to Jamie's point um, on, on prudence, just to make sure um, that investors are not uh, trade over trading, trading too much and uh, maintain that kind of long term investment philosophy. Yeah, I think that's a really good uh, takeaway there, Andy. Um, Corey, maybe I could come to you for just a quick takeaway. What would you tell a retail investor looking at using ETFs as a sort of uh, what, what, what should they be watching out for? What should they be considering for the future? You know, what's your key 30 seconds takeaway? For sure. I think for me, I think, as I said before, there is loads of choice, but it's really just important to, uh, to be really comfortable and understand what exposure you're getting from the ETF. So the name can be similar to another ETF, but the exposure and how the provider goes about providing it can differ. So just really doing and using as much content as you can that's available on provider websites, etc., to to just really be comfortable with the exposure. And I know it's a corny phrase, but I think it's very relevant in terms of just focusing on the time in the market as opposed to time in the market. It's a, it's a commonly used phrase in the industry. And I think it's very important when you're thinking about using long-term uh, or if you have a long-term horizon uh, in your investing strategy. So, yeah. And Don, same question to you. What's your key takeaway for investors today? I, I think that the journey should begin with a, a diversified long-term portfolio. Um, and there, are, if, if you're not, super comfortable in trying to build that, then there are the managed portfolios that, that Andy was talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's a great place to start. And then as you get a bit more confident, you, you can always, um, you know, dip a toe into the DIY side of things. But I think as a starting point, it's always a, a well-diversified long-term portfolio. All right, stuff. And James, obviously, last but last, not least, what's your takeaway today? Yeah, I, I want to echo um, the comments of Corey and, and Don. Um, obviously, invest in the long term, diversify your portfolio and appoint a model portfolio provider like Invest Engine. But if you are going to invest in your PA and do it yourself, just invest in what you believe in. Um, I think really understand the investment you're looking at. Um, and if you are going to take calls and think there's a growth opportunity, do it in something you believe in because you always feel much better uh, losing money in an area that you believe in, like I said, around veganism and sustainable future of food, than if I do it in an area that um, I don't believe in and my values um, contradict. Um, so yeah, that would be my kind of last takeaway. 
Fantastic. I think we've tied a nice bow on it today, um, looking at ETFs and obviously how they, you know, will play a significant role in the future of investing um, and hopefully retail investment in, in the strategy, in the uh, structure continues to grow here in Europe as it has done over in the US. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and please do remember that a recording of the webinar will be available on the Invest Engine blog um, later on. So do take a look at that if you'd like to sort of recount any of the points made today. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to the panelists for joining us today and sharing their expertise um, and for the opportunity to have me on as well. Um, thank you very much, everyone, and have a great evening. Um, hopefully speak to you soon. Take care. Bye.